Chapter Fifteen. Our eyes have seen great wonders. I write this from day to day, but I trust that before I come to the end of it, I may be able to say that the light shines at last through our clouds. We are held here with no clear means of making our escape, and bitterly we chafe against it. Yet I can well imagine that the day may come when we may be glad that we were kept against our will to see something more of the wonders of this singular place and of the creatures who inhabit it. The victory of the Indians and the annihilation of the ape-men marked the turning point of our fortunes. From then onwards we were in truth masters of the plateau, for the natives looked upon us with a mixture of fear and gratitude, since by our strange powers we had aided them to destroy their hereditary foe. For their own sakes they would, perhaps, be glad to see the departure of such formidable and incalculable people, but they have not themselves suggested any way by which we may reach the plains below. There had been, so far as we could follow their signs, a tunnel by which the place could be approached, the lower exit of which we had seen from below. By this, no doubt, both ape-men and Indians had at different epochs reached the top, and Maple White with his companions had taken the same way. Only the year before, however, there had been a terrific earthquake, and the upper end of the tunnel had fallen in and completely disappeared. The Indians now could only shake their heads and shrug their shoulders when they expressed by signs our desire to descend. It may be that they cannot, but it may also be that they will not, help us to get away. At the end of the victorious campaign the surviving ape-folk were driven across the plateau, their wailings were horrible, and established in the neighborhood of the Indian caves, where they would, from now onwards, be a servile race under the eyes of their masters. It was a rude, raw, primeval version of the Jews in Babylon, or the Israelites in Egypt. At night we could hear from amid the trees the long-drawn cry, as some primitive Ezekiel mourned for fallen greatness, and recalled the departed glories of ape-town. Hewers of wood and drawers of water, such were they, from now onwards. We had returned across the plateau with our allies two days after the battle, and made our camp at the foot of their cliffs. They would have had us share their caves with them, but Lord John would by no means consent to it, considering that to do so would put us in their power if they were treacherously disposed. We kept our independence, therefore, and had our weapons ready for any emergency, while preserving the most friendly relations. We also continually visited their caves, which were most remarkable places, though whether made by man or by nature we have never been able to determine. They were all on the one stratum, hollowed out of some soft rock which lay between the volcanic basalt forming the ruddy cliffs above them, and the hard granite which formed their base. The openings were about eighty feet above the ground, and were led up to by long stone stairs, so narrow and steep that no large animal could mount them. Inside they were warm and dry, running in straight passages of varying length into the side of the hill, with smooth gray walls decorated with many excellent pictures, done with charred sticks, and representing the various animals of the plateau. If every living thing were swept from the country, the future explorer would find upon the walls of these caves ample evidence of the strange fauna, the dinosaurs, iguanodons, and fish lizards, which had lived so recently upon earth. Since we had learned that the huge iguanodons were kept as tame herds by their owners, and were simply walking meat stores, we had conceived that man, even with his primitive weapons, had established his ascendancy upon the plateau. We were soon to discover that it was not so, and that he was still there upon tolerance. It was on the third day after our forming our camp near the Indian caves that the tragedy occurred. Challenger and Summerlee had gone off together that day to the lake where some of the natives, under their direction, were engaged in harpooning specimens of the great lizards. Lord John and I had remained in our camp while a number of the Indians were scattered about upon the grassy slope in front of the caves, engaged in different ways. 
Suddenly there was a shrill cry of alarm, with the word Stoa resounding from a hundred tongues. From every side men, women, and children were rushing wildly for shelter, swarming up the staircases and into the caves in a mad stampede. Looking up, we could see them waving their arms from the rocks above and beckoning to us to join them in their refuge. We had both seized our magazine rifles and ran out to see what the danger could be. Suddenly, from the near belt of trees, there broke forth a group of twelve or fifteen Indians, running for their lives, and at their very heels two of those frightful monsters which had disturbed our camp and pursued me upon my solitary journey. In shape, they were like horrible toads, and moved in a succession of springs, but in size they were of an incredible bulk, larger than the largest elephant. We had never before seen them, save at night, and indeed they are nocturnal animals, save when disturbed in their lairs, as these had been. We now stood amazed at the sight, for their blotched and warty skins were of a curious fish-like iridescence and the sunlight struck them with an ever-varying rainbow bloom as they moved. We had little time to watch them, however, for in an instant they had overtaken the fugitives and were making a dire slaughter among them. Their method was to fall forward with their full weight upon each in turn, leaving him crushed and mangled, to bound on after the others. The wretched Indians screamed with terror, but were helpless, run as they would, before the relentless purpose and horrible activity of these monstrous creatures. One after another they went down, and there was not half a dozen surviving by the time my companion and I could come to their help. But our aid was of little avail, and only involved us in the same peril. At the range of a couple of hundred yards we emptied our magazines, firing bullet after bullet into the beasts but with no more effect than if we were pelting them with pellets of paper. Their slow reptilian natures cared nothing for wounds, and the springs of their lives, with no special brain center but scattered throughout their spinal cords, could not be tapped by any modern weapons. The most that we could do was to check their progress by distracting their attention with the flash and roar of our guns, and so to give both the natives and ourselves time to reach the steps which led to safety but where the conical explosive bullets of the twentieth century were of no avail. The poisoned arrows of the natives, dipped in the juice of strophanthus and steeped afterwards in decayed carrion, could succeed. Such arrows were of little avail to the hunter who attacked the beast, because their action in that torpid circulation was slow, and before its powers failed it could certainly overtake and slay its assailant. But now, as the two monsters hounded us to the very foot of the stairs, a drift of darts came whistling from every chink in the cliff above them. In a minute they were feathered with them, and yet with no sign of pain they clawed and slobbered with impotent rage at the steps which would lead them to their victims, mounting clumsily up for a few yards, and then sliding down again to the ground. But at last the poison worked. One of them gave a deep rumbling groan, and dropped his huge squat head on to the earth. The other bounded round in an eccentric circle with shrill, wailing cries, and then lying down, writhed in agony for some minutes before it also stiffened, and lay still. With yells of triumph the Indians came flocking down from their caves, and danced a frenzied dance of victory round the dead bodies in mad joy that two more of the most dangerous of all their enemies had been slain. That night they cut up and removed the bodies, not to eat, for the poison was still active, but lest they should breed a pestilence. The great reptilian hearts, however, each as large as a cushion, still lay there, beating slowly and steadily, with a gentle rise and fall, in horrible independent life. It was only upon the third day that the ganglia ran down and the dreadful things were still. Some day, when I have a better desk than a meat tin, and more helpful tools than a worn stub of pencil and a last tattered notebook, I will write some fuller account of the Akala Indians, of our life amongst them, and of the glimpses which we had of the strange conditions of wondrous maple-white land. 
memory at least will never fail me, for so long as the breath of life is in me, every hour and every action of that period will stand out as hard and clear as do the first strange happenings of our childhood. No new impressions could have faced those which are so deeply cut. When the time comes I will describe that wondrous moonlit night upon the huge lake when a young ichthyosaurus, a strange creature, half seal, half fish to look at, with bone-covered eyes on each side of his snout, and a third eye fixed upon the top of his head, was entangled in an Indian net, and nearly upset our canoe before we towed it ashore. The same night that a green water-snake shot out from the rushes and carried off in its coils the steersman of Challenger's canoe. I will tell, too, of the great nocturnal white thing. To this day we do not know whether it was beast or reptile which lived in a vile swamp to the east of the lake, and flitted about with a faint phosphorescent glimmer in the darkness. The Indians were so terrified at it that they would not go near the place, and though we twice made expeditions and saw it each time, we could not make our way through the deep marsh in which it lived. I can only say that it seemed to be larger than a cow, and had the strangest musky odor. I will tell also of the huge bird which chased Challenger to the shelter of the rocks one day, a great running bird, far taller than an ostrich, with a vulture-like neck and cruel head which made it a walking death. As Challenger climbed to safety, one dart of its savage curving beak shore off the heel of his boot, as if it had been cut with a chisel. This time at least modern weapons prevailed, and the great creature, twelve feet from head to foot, Phororachus, its name, according to our panting but exultant professor, went down before Lord Roxton's rifle in a flurry of waving feathers and kicking limbs, with two remorseless yellow eyes glaring up from the midst of it. May I live to see that flattened, vicious skull in its own niche among the trophies of the Albany. Finally, I will assuredly give some account of the Toxodon, the giant ten-foot guinea-pig, with projecting chisel teeth, which we killed as it drank in the grey of the morning by the side of the lake. All this I shall some day write at fuller length, and amidst these more stirring days I would tenderly sketch in these lovely summer evenings, when with the deep blue sky above us we lay in good comradeship among the long grasses by the wood, and marvelled at the strange fowl that swept over us and the quaint new creatures which crept from their burrows to watch us, while above us the boughs of the bushes were heavy with luscious fruit, and below us strange and lovely flowers peeped at us from among the herbage, or those long moonlit nights when we lay out upon the shimmering surface of the great lake, and watched with wonder and awe the huge circles rippling out from the sudden splash of some fantastic monster, or the greenish gleam far down in the deep water, of some strange creature upon the confines of darkness. These are the scenes which my mind and my pen will dwell upon in every detail at some future day. But, you will ask, why these experiences and why this delay, when you and your comrades should have been occupied day and night in the devising of some means by which you could return to the outer world? My answer is, that there was not one of us who was not working for this end, but that our work had been in vain. One fact we had very speedily discovered. The Indians would do nothing to help us. In every other way they were our friends, one might almost say our devoted slaves, but when it was suggested that they should help us to make and carry a plank which would bridge the chasm, or when we wished to get from them thongs of leather or liana, to weave ropes which might help us, we were met by a good-humoured but an invincible refusal. They would smile, twinkle their eyes, shake their heads, and there was the end of it. Even the old chief met us with the same obstinate denial, and it was only Meritas, the youngster whom we had saved, who looked wistfully at us and told us by his gestures that he was grieved for our thwarted wishes. Ever since their crowning triumph with the ape-men they looked upon us as supermen, who bore victory in the tubes of strange weapons, 
and they believed that so long as we remained with them good fortune would be theirs. A little red-skinned wife and a cave of our own were freely offered to each of us if we would but forget our own people and dwell forever upon the plateau. So far all had been kindly, however far apart our desires might be, but we felt well assured that our actual plans of a descent must be kept secret, for we had reason to fear that at the last they might try to hold us by force. In spite of the danger from dinosaurs, which is not great save at night, for, as I may have said before, they are mostly nocturnal in their habits, I have twice in the last three weeks been over to our old camp in order to see our negro, who still kept watch and ward below the cliff. My eyes strained eagerly across the great plain in the hope of seeing afar off the help for which we had prayed. But the long, cactus-strewn levels still stretched away, empty and bare, to the distant line of the canebrake. "'They will soon come now, Massa Boulogne. Before another week pass, Indian come back and bring rope and fetch you down.' Such was the cheery cry of our excellent Zambo. I had one strange experience as I came away from the second visit, which had involved my being away for a night from my companions. I was returning along the well-remembered route, and had reached a spot within a mile or so of the marsh of the pterodactyls, when I saw an extraordinary object approaching me. It was a man who walked inside a framework made of bent canes, so that he was enclosed on all sides in a bell-shaped cage. As I drew nearer I was more amazed still to see that it was Lord John Roxton. When he saw me he slipped from under his curious protection, and came towards me laughing, and yet, as I thought, with some confusion in his manner. "'Well, young fella," said he, "'who would have thought of meeting you up here?' "'What in the world are you doing?' I asked. "'Visiting, my friend, the pterodactyls,' said he. "'But why?' Interesting beast, don't you think? But unsociable. Nasty, rude way with strangers, as you may remember. So I rigged this framework which keeps them from being too pressing in their attentions. But what do you want in the swamp? He looked at me with a very questioning eye, and I read hesitation in his face. Don't you think other people besides professors can want to know things? He said at last. I'm studying the pretty dears that's enough for you no offence said i his good humour returned and he laughed no offence young fella i'm going to get a young devil chick for challenger that's one of my jobs no i don't want your company i'm safe in this cage and you are not so long and i'll be back in camp by nightfall he turned away and i left him wandering on through the wood with his extraordinary cage around him if Lord John's behaviour at this time was strange, that of Challenger was more so. I may say that he seemed to possess an extraordinary fascination for the Indian women, and that he always carried a large spreading palm branch with which he beat them off, as if they were flies, when their attentions became too pressing. To see him walking like a comic opera sultan, with this badge of authority in his hand, his black beard bristling in front of him, his toes pointing at each step, and a train of wide-eyed Indian girls behind him, clad in their slender drapery of bark cloth, is one of the most grotesque of all the pictures which I will carry back with me. As to Summerlee, he was absorbed in the insect and bird life of the plateau, and spent his whole time, save that considerable portion which was devoted to abusing Challenger for not getting us out of our difficulties, in cleaning and mounting his specimens. Challenger had been in the habit of walking off by himself every morning, and returning from time to time with looks of portentous solemnity, as one who bears the full weight of a great enterprise upon his shoulders. One day, palm branch in hand, and his crowd of adoring devotees behind him, he led us down to his hidden workshop, and took us into the secret of his plans. The place was a small clearing in the centre of a palm grove and this was one of those boiling mud geysers which I have already described. Around its edge were scattered a number of leathern thongs cut from iguanodon hide, 
and a large collapsed membrane which proved to be the dried and scraped stomach of one of the great fish lizards from the lake. This huge sack had been sewn up at one end, and only a small orifice left at the other. Into this opening several bamboo canes had been inserted, and the other ends of these canes were in contact with conical clay funnels, which collected the gas bubbling up through the mud of the geyser. Soon the flaccid organ began to slowly expand, and show a tendency to upward movements, the challenger fastened the cords, which held it to the trunks of the surrounding trees. In half an hour a good-sized gas bag had been formed, and the jerking and straining upon the thongs showed that it was capable of considerable lift. Challenger, like a glad father in the presence of his firstborn, stood smiling and stroking his beard, in silent, self-satisfied content as he gazed at the creation of his brain. It was Summerlee who first broke the silence. "'You don't mean us to go up in that thing, Challenger?' said he in an acid voice. "'I mean, my dear Summerlee, to give you such a demonstration of its powers that, after seeing it, you will, I am sure, have no hesitation in trusting yourself to it.' "'You can put it right out of your head now at once,' said Summerlee with decision. "'Nothing on earth would induce me to commit such a folly. Lord John, I trust you will not countenance such madness?' "'Deuced ingenious, I call it,' said our peer. "'I'd like to see how it works.' "'So you shall,' said Challenger. "'For some days I have exerted my whole brain force upon the problem of how we shall descend from these cliffs. We have satisfied ourselves that we cannot climb down, and that there is no tunnel. We are also unable to construct any kind of bridge which may take us back to the pinnacle from which we came.' How, then, shall I find a means to convey us? Some little time ago I had remarked to our young friend here that free hydrogen was evolved from the geyser. The idea of a balloon naturally followed. I was, I will admit, somewhat baffled by the difficulty of discovering an envelope to contain the gas, but the contemplation of the immense entrails of these reptiles supplied me with a solution to the problem. Behold the result! He put one hand in the front of his ragged jacket, and pointed proudly with the other. By this time the gas-bag had swollen to a goodly rotundity, and was jerking strongly upon its lashings. "'Midsummer madness!' snorted Summerlee. Lord John was delighted with the whole idea. "'Clever, old dear, ain't he?' he whispered to me, and then louder to Challenger. "'What about a car?' "'The car will be my next care.' I have already planned how it is to be made and attached. Meanwhile I will simply show you how capable my apparatus is of supporting the weight of each of us. All of us, surely? No, it is part of my plan that each in turn shall descend as in a parachute, and the balloon be drawn back by means which I shall have no difficulty in perfecting. If it will support the weight of one, and let him gently down, it will have done all that is required of it. I will now show you its capacity in that direction." He brought out a lump of basalt of a considerable size, constructed in the middle, so that a cord could be easily attached to it. This cord was the one which we had brought with us on to the plateau after we had used it for climbing the pinnacle. It was over a hundred feet long, and though it was thin it was very strong. He had prepared a sort of collar of leather with many straps depending from it. This collar was placed over the dome of the balloon, and the hanging thongs were gathered together below, so that the pressure of any weight would be diffused over a considerable surface. Then the lump of basalt was fastened to the thongs, and the rope was allowed to hang from the end of it, being passed three times round the professor's arm. "'I will now,' said Challenger, with a smile of pleased anticipation, "'demonstrate the carrying power of my balloon.' As he said so, he cut with a knife the various lashings that held it. Never was our expedition in more imminent danger of complete annihilation. The inflated membrane shot up with frightful velocity into the air. In an instant Challenger was pulled off his feet and dragged after it. I had just time to throw my arms round his ascending waist when I was myself whipped up into the air. 
Lord John had me with a rat-track grip around the legs, but I felt that he also was coming off the ground. For a moment I had a vision of four adventurers floating like a string of sausages over the land that they had explored. But, happily, there were limits to the strain which the rope would stand, though none apparently to the lifting powers of this infernal machine. There was a sharp crack, and we were in a heap upon the ground with coils of rope all over us. When we were able to stagger to our feet, we saw far off in the deep blue sky one dark spot where the lump of basalt was speeding upon its way. "'Splendid!' cried the undaunted challenger, rubbing his injured arm. "'A most thorough and satisfactory demonstration. I could not have anticipated such a success. Within a week, gentlemen, I promise that a second balloon will be prepared, and then you can count upon taking in safety and comfort the first stage of our homeward journey. So far I have written each of the foregoing events as it occurred. Now I am rounding off my narrative from the old camp, where Zambo has waited so long, with all our difficulties and dangers left like a dream behind us, upon the summit of those vast, ruddy crags which tower above our heads. We have descended in safety, though in a most unexpected fashion, and all is well with us. In six weeks or two months we shall be in London, and it is possible that this letter may not reach you much earlier than we do ourselves. Already our hearts yearn, and our spirits fly towards the great mother city which holds so much that is dear to us. It was on the very evening of our perilous adventure with Challenger's homemade balloon that the change came in our fortunes. I have said that the one person from whom we had had some sign of sympathy in our attempts to get away was the young chief whom we had rescued. He alone had no desire to hold us against our will in a strange land. He had told us as much by his expressive language of signs. That evening, after dusk, he came down to our little camp, handed me, for some reason he had always shown his attentions to me, perhaps because I was the one who was nearest his age, a small roll of the bark of a tree, and then pointing solemnly up at the row of caves above him, he had put his finger to his lips as a sign of secrecy, and had stolen back again to his people. I took the slip of bark to the firelight, and we examined it together. It was about a foot square, and on the inner side there was a singular arrangement of lines which I here reproduce. They were neatly done in charcoal upon the white surface, and looked to me at first sight like some sort of rough musical score. "'Whatever it is, I can swear that it is of importance to us,' said I. I could read that on his face as he gave it. "'Unless we have come upon a primitive practical joker,' Summerlee suggested, "'which I should think would be one of the most elementary developments of man.' "'It is clearly some sort of script,' said Challenger. "'Looks like a guinea-puzzle competition,' remarked Lord John, craning his neck to have a look at it. Then suddenly he stretched out his hand and seized the puzzle. "'By George!' he cried. "'I believe I've got it. The boy guessed right the very first time. See here. How many marks are on that paper? Eighteen. Well, if you come to think of it, there are eighteen cave openings on the hillside above us." "'He pointed up to the caves when he gave it to me,' said I. "'Well, that settles it. This is a chart of the caves. What? Eighteen of them all in a row, some short, some deep, some branching, same as we saw them. It's a map, and here's a cross on it. What's the cross for?' it is placed to mark one that is much deeper than the others. "'One that goes through!' I cried. "'I believe our young friend has read the riddle,' said Challenger. "'If the cave does not go through, I do not understand why this person, who has every reason to mean us well, should have drawn our attention to it. But if it does go through, and comes out at the corresponding point on the other side, we should not have more than a hundred feet to descend.' A hundred feet, grumbled Summerlee. Well, our rope is still more than a hundred feet long, I cried. Surely we could get down. 
"'How about the Indians in the cave?' Summerlee objected. "'There are no Indians in any of the caves above our heads,' said I. "'They are all used as barns and storehouses. Why should we not go up there now at once and spy out the land?' There is a dry, bituminous wood upon the plateau, a species of araucaria, according to our botanist, which is always used by the Indians for torches. Each of us picked up a faggot of this, and we made our way up weed-covered steps to the particular cave which was marked in the drawing. It was, as I have said, empty, save for a great number of enormous bats, which flapped round our heads as we advanced into it. As we had no desire to draw the attention of the Indians to our proceedings, we stumbled along in the dark until we had gone round several curves, and penetrated a considerable distance into the cavern. Then at last we lit our torches. It was a beautiful dry tunnel with smooth grey walls covered with native symbols, a curved roof which arched over our heads, and white glistening sand beneath our feet. We hurried eagerly along it until, with a deep groan of bitter disappointment, we were brought to a halt. A sheer wall of rock had appeared before us, with no chink through which a mouse could have slipped. There was no escape for us there. We stood with bitter hearts staring at this unexpected obstacle. It was not the result of any convulsion, as in the case of the ascending tunnel. The end wall was exactly like the side ones. It was, and had always been, a cul-de-sac. "'Never mind, my friends,' said the indomitable challenger. "'You still have my firm promise of a balloon.' Summerlee groaned. "'Can we be in the wrong cave?' I suggested. "'No use, young fella,' said Lord John, with his finger on the chart. Seventeen from the right, second from the left. This is the cave, sure enough.' I looked at the mark to which his finger pointed, and I gave a sudden cry of joy. I believe I have it. Follow me. Follow me. I hurried back along the way we had come, my torch in my hand. Here, said I, pointing to some matches upon the ground, is where we lit up. Exactly. Well, it is marked as a fort cave, and in the darkness we passed the fork before the torches were lit. On the right side, as we go out, we should find the longer arm. It was as I had said. We had not gone thirty yards before a great black opening loomed in the wall. We turned into it to find that we were in a much larger passage than before. Along it we hurried in breathless impatience for many hundreds of yards. Then suddenly, in the black darkness of the arch in front of us, we saw a gleam of dark red light. We stared in amazement. A sheet of steady flame seemed to cross the passage and to bar our way. We hastened towards it. No sound, no heat, no movement came from it, but still the great luminous curtain glowed before us, silvering all the cave and turning the sand to powdered jewels, until as we drew closer it discovered a circular edge. "'The moon, by George!' cried Lord John. "'We are through, boys, we are through!' It was indeed the full moon which shone straight down the aperture which opened upon the cliffs. It was a small rift, not larger than a window, but it was enough for all our purposes. As we craned our necks through it we could see that the descent was not a very difficult one, and that the level ground was no very great way below us. It was no wonder that from below we had not observed the place, as the cliffs curved overhead and an ascent at that spot would have seemed so impossible as to discourage close inspection. We satisfied ourselves that with the help of our rope we could find our way down, and then returned rejoicing to our camp to make our preparations for the next evening. What we did we had to do quickly and secretly, since even at this last hour the Indians might hold us back. Our stores we would leave behind us, save only our guns and cartridges. But Challenger had some unwieldy stuff which he ardently desired to take with him, and one particular package, of which I may not speak, which gave us more labor than any. Slowly the day passed, but when the darkness fell we were ready for our departure. With much labor we got our things up the steps, and then, 
looking back, took one last long survey of that strange land, soon I fear to be vulgarized, the prey of hunter and prospector, but to each of us a dreamland of glamour and romance, a land where we had dared much, suffered much, and learned much, our land, as we shall ever fondly call it. Along upon our left the neighbouring caves each threw out its ruddy cheery firelight into the gloom. From the slope below us rose the voices of the Indians as they laughed and sang. Beyond was the long sweep of the woods, and in the centre, shimmering vaguely through the gloom, was the great lake, the mother of strange monsters. Even as we looked, a high wickering cry, the call of some weird animal, rang clear out of the darkness. It was the very voice of Maple White Land bidding us good-bye. We turned and plunged into the cave which led to home. Two hours later, we, our packages, and all we owned, were at the foot of the cliff. Save for Challenger's luggage, we had never a difficulty. Leaving it all where we descended, we started at once for Zambo's camp. In the early morning we approached it, but only to find, to our amazement, not one fire but a dozen upon the plain. The rescue party had arrived. There were twenty Indians from the river, with stakes, ropes, and all that could be useful for bridging the chasm. At least we shall have no difficulty now in carrying our packages, when to-morrow we begin to make our way back to the Amazon. And so, in humble and thankful mood, I close this account. Our eyes have seen great wonders, and our souls are chastened by what we have endured. Each is in his own way a better and deeper man. It may be that when we reach Para we shall stop to refit. If we do, this letter will be a mail ahead. If not, it will reach London on the very day that I do. In either case, my dear Mr. McArdle, I hope very soon to shake you by the hand. End of chapter.